Ruby Volume 7 Chapter 5 Sparks has officially released, so let me break it down for you. So the first third of the episode is a bit of a montage. Our characters are up to a whole plethora of new responsibilities. Training, guarding the wall from white walkers, and getting women out of their prime so soaking wet you could open a water park. Apparently, the MILFs of Remnant are really into dudes who look like they have about uh, 17 bananas glued to the top of their head. Also returning is Funky. Remember them from Volume 3? They had a semi-positive reception to them. They're back because... Meanwhile, Ruby, Penny, Clover, and Crow are on a different job, transporting materials to Amity Arena. Sure, they could fly, but that costs valuable dust, so they gotta do it the old-fashioned way. By car. But what seems like a straightforward errand turns into an old-fashioned standoff. Robin Hill makes her debut, blocking the road, demanding to know what's going on with Amity Arena. Turns out our characters don't have to tell her anything, and after her plan of maybe killing them when they weren't paying attention didn't work, she let them through. Robin Hill, first impressions. I won't lie, not the best. I'm not any more interested in her than I was before, and the scene really lacked tension to me. Like, at first, when her goons were sneaking up, I was expecting, like, an army. But when it turned out to just be two people, come on. We had four named characters versus one new character and three no-names. There was no tension in this scene because there was no cause for me to have any. Without any prior feats of strength, the imagination is left to believe these are just three grunts. Whether that's the case or not is irrelevant. The Lamb Lady holds the most unique design and all of their weapons look like the scraps of other people's better weapons. I was more than positive that any one of these four could have taken out at least three of these other four. So it wound up feeling a bit awkward and laughable, like, oh, that's cute that you think you could actually do anything. Also, Robin's running for council. <laughs> Yippee, my favorite plotline. But Clover, Clover only continues to be more suspicious. On a side note, I started watching and caught up on all of Dr. Stone a few days ago, and there was a line in there that just stuck with me during Crow and Clover's interaction. And that was a line that said, a man who praises another man to his face is full of ulterior motives. It wasn't a line that stuck with me at the time, but when Clover began complimenting Crow, my mind just immediately rewound time and picked out that statement. And God do I love it. I know it's not much relevant to anything, but go watch Dr. Stone if you haven't. It's so unbelievably good. But it does seem like he's fishing for something. Plus, he had an absolutely shady as hell line, so... Your niece sure is one of a kind, huh? So after the standoff failed, we cut to Weiss's training. She is, of course, learning from her sister, where the two discuss a whole bunch of different things. Not the least of which is Winter being the candidate for the next Winter Maiden. Uh, Jesus Christ, where do I begin with these two? There was genuinely so much. Overall, I think it was really, really good. The interaction and conversation with these two managed to feel real, personal, and honest. These two's chemistry is nailed pretty much to a T. Surprisingly, a relationship and interaction like this hasn't existed in the show for all of these years. And it should have. It very easily should have already existed in the show prior to this volume because I don't know if you remember this. It's actually incredibly subtle and goes uh, quite easily forgotten because of how little the show does anything with this. But do you guys remember that Ruby and Yang are also sisters? I know, pff, how could you have forgotten? It's so easy to forget. But despite being sisters, Ruby and Yang haven't interacted on that meaningful of a level on screen. Yet despite what is supposed to be a very open and loving sistership between those two, the show's never done anything with it. Yet here, where Winter is meant to be an incredibly stern and closed off individual, these two have felt more like sisters than Ruby and Yang ever have. And maybe that has to do with why the scene worked out so well, because we've never had that until now. And the way it managed to convey their relationship through simple dialogue was, dare I say, genius. Simple, but effective. Like I said, Winter is a bit of a shutoff and doesn't like wearing her emotions on her sleeve. But they had her show concern and care over Weiss by having her propose she joined the military. Why is this so effective? Because as Winter stated, when she dropped the Schnee family name and joined the military, she found purpose, she found guidance, she found what and who she wanted to be. And she wants that same thing for Weiss. 
Sure, from an outside perspective looking in, you know that likely won't happen, and she probably has no desire to do that. In fact, she later says how she'd rather not. But Winter wants Weiss to have what she has, freedom, purpose, and though she probably isn't showing it, happiness. While she doesn't directly spell it out for you, thank goodness, this is the subtext that no matter which way you read it shows that Winter cares. And the fact that it wasn't the perfect answer was even better. In an alternate script, I could totally imagine there being some sort of iteration where Winter tells Weiss to follow her heart and it'll all lead to the right place inevitably, or some cheesy thing like that. But by having Winter suggest she join Atlas to me, implies she knows this solution worked out for her, and so it has the highest probability of working out for her sister as well. It's small things like that that I think are left open to interpretation. It's objectively a flawed solution, but you know why and where she's coming from. It's a solution she, and only she, could have recommended to her. But while it really adds to Winter, the moment also takes itself to showcase Weiss. She's not like her sister, and that's not in a bad way. Winter is more than happy to completely get rid of the Shini name and everything that comes with it. But here, it establishes Weiss is not like that. She doesn't want to abandon the name and company, she wants to restore it. She believes it has been taken into a bad place and drugged through the mud, but instead of leaving it behind, she wants to do something about it. Weiss and Winter are very different individuals and have very different motivations, and this scene made their whole conversation feel natural and not like an exposition dump. This is the quality of sisters being on screen. Not whenever Ruby gets injured which then throws Yang into cause for concern. The scene did something incredibly simple, but its effectiveness was beyond what the show has done prior. But alright, alright, that's enough praise, let's calm down. You see, during my initial watch through, I didn't think anything too weird of any of Weiss's statements. But upon going back, what is she doing? She's being so terrible. Weiss throughout this whole thing is like constantly trying to sow seeds of doubt and discourse into Winter and Ironwood's relationship. You know what this reminds me of? Weiss reminds me of like a disapproving parent talking about their daughter's boyfriend where it's just like, you know, people like him are often selfish. Can he be trusted? Do you know all of his secrets? It's like, what are you doing? You're projecting. It's just because all of those things apply to Ozpin and your experiences does not give you the right to ruin Winter and Ironwood's whole trust thing that they've got going on. Especially because of what Weiss said, there were two statements in particular which are very, very easily hypocritical. The first thing was doing what you think is right, and Weiss states that it's often for selfish reasons, as if to throw shade onto Ironwood while at the same time ignoring what Ruby's doing. Like Weiss, hate to say it, isn't exactly an expert in human psychology and the nature of man. Weiss is like 18, maybe, I don't know how old she is anymore. And not even two years ago was she incredibly proud of everything the Schnee Dust Company was doing. Her life experience is not that much. A statement like that needs someone with life experience behind them. They've met people, they've met a lot of people, they understand how they work. An adult, or an old character. Like, this is some statement most warranted for Salem or Ozpin. Because they've lived, they've seen humans, they know what they do, why they do it. Obviously hypocritical if Ozpin said it, but you get the point, you don't need to be an immortal being. Now wife knows like two people this applies to. And the second statement was all about secrets. Can Winter be sure Ironwood isn't hiding anything? What a dumb statement. It's not necessarily the fact that the statement was made, but it's mainly due to the fact that it seems to have done something to Winter. As if it was some big revelation. She, she made a face. Breaking news! The answer is no, no matter who you are. Can Weiss be certain that Ruby isn't hiding anything from her? No, the answer is no. You are not capable, no matter the human being, of 100% being sure that you know all of their secrets and whatever else. You cannot certainly know anything about anyone that isn't yourself. That's why the whole concept of trust exists. I'm sure Ironwood hasn't disclosed to Winter the length of his iron wood, if you know what I'm saying. Why? Because not everything needs to be known or is relevant. Like, even if they are hiding something from you, trust means you expect it for good reason, and you're okay with it. 
You ever had a friend where you ask them something and they're just like, I don't want to talk about it. You typically go, all right, man, that's fine. You don't go, well, I guess I can't trust you. We are no longer friends. Above all else, I feel as though a lot of what Weiss said was meant for Ruby and applies much better to her. But for whatever reason, Weiss was given these lines about trusting and stuff. But as I was saying earlier, Weiss's whole motivation of the SDC is much more befitting of her character. Like, obviously it's fine that all of the characters have the overall same sort of goal, but the whole trust problem thing has been placed onto Ruby and is ultimately her decision. And I wouldn't like to see Ruby's problems and concerns fall upon other characters who at the end of the day clearly have no say in whether or not they tell Ironwood. Pretty much, I feel as though Weiss was just given Ruby dialogue. Also, to slightly talk about, because not much to say, The Winter Maiden. Obviously, we don't know much about her. She's not Weiss's mom, she's just some random chick. For the most part, I really like this scene. I mean, it plays right off the past one with the conversation with Weiss and Winter, but the reason it didn't get clumped into the praising section, but rather the I'ma make fun of that section, is because I feel as though Weiss ruined the moment at least twice. By that I mean, in the previous scene and this one, there were times where I felt as though Winter was trying to bestow her elder sibling wisdom upon her novice sister. But Weiss, like, keeps lumping herself in at, like, the final moment. Like, in this scene with the Winter Maiden, Winter's telling Weiss all about how she's accepted her role as the next Maiden, and how she chose this for herself, not because anyone else did this for her. But at, right at the end, Weiss keeps going like, I guess we've both done that, eh, sis? And I just laugh at these because it feels like Winter's trying to teach Weiss things about life, but they just keep going right over her head. So I can't help but make fun of it. But at the end of the day, was this a bad episode? Absolutely not. It was an absolutely great episode. My biggest problem with the episode was unironically an audio problem. I made fun of Weiss for a bit, but I'm just taking the piss out of that. The audio thing, no joke, wound up taking a pet peeve of mine that I have as a YouTuber, and that's having music with lyrics overlaid on top of dialogue. Because in the beginning of the episode, it's a whole montage sequence, and they're playing whatever new song is from the album that'll get released. But what ticked me was there was still dialogue being spoken, and so, as a content creator, I've always hated videos where someone is narrating, and there's just a song with lyrics in the background. Because the problem this faces is you then have competing dialogue. Ironwood and whoever else in the show is speaking and narrating, but the song is competing for the words that are being heard. And it draws the attention away from the important dialogue being spoken, and it's very easy to drift into the lyrics of the song that is being played. Like I said, this is a pet peeve of mine as a content creator. I couldn't tell you how many Ruby videos I've seen where someone is narrating a video, and they just have some Ruby song in the background, lyrics and all. And often I'll wind up indirectly focusing on the music, because it can very easily be more entertaining than what's being said. Here's my advice, if you're making videos when you're narrating something, Always use the instrumental, never have music in the background that is saying anything. And so I was thinking about this montage and I thought, but would it sound better if there were no lyrics? And weirdly, the answer is no. They managed to find this weird sweet spot where there's just enough dialogue that the music's lyrics interrupt and compete for attention, but not enough dialogue to warrant using the instrumental. Here's what I would have done, because what it seems like is they just took the music track and slapped it on. I would go back and when the characters are talking, just lower, lower the music a little bit. Right now, it's just set at one volume the entire scene. I recommend whenever a character is talking, just, just lower the music a few decibels. And when they stop, raise it back to normal. Ruby is unironically the only show I really watch where they constantly use lyrical songs. Oftentimes it's in fights when there's hardly any dialogue to begin with, so it works out. But this time, this time I noticed and my inner content creator is absolutely annoyed. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that little YouTube 101. At the end of the day, it was a really good episode. Winter really shone above everyone else and the relationship between her and her sister is believable and new, as weird as that sounds. The writing worked where it mattered the most, it was meaningful and refreshing. But I'll be damned if the audio didn't annoy me.